Uh, so what treatment guidelines are available for cardiac sarcoidosis? So uh, in uh, three or four years ago, the American Heart Association mm -hmm. published a consensus statement on cardiac sarcoidosis. And most of us refer to that as the gold standard document. Um, it may be updated at some point in the near future, but uh, those guidelines are what we use in terms of how do we treat patients, how do we diagnose patients, and, and how do we monitor patients. Um, there are smaller pieces of literature out there but there is really only one large set of guidelines that we use. Um, in terms of guidelines, um, myself and a, a group of seven or other eight uh, people uh, interested in sarcoidosis are currently writing a clinical statement for sarcoidosis, which is predominantly lung sarcoid, but there will be a small section on cardiac sarcoid uh, within that statement. Uh, where can uh, GPs and other uh, healthcare providers look for more information on cardiac sarcoidosis? Um, well, the British Lung Foundation has uh, an area. Uh, sarcoidosis UK, of course, has uh, some leaflets and a specific area on cardiac sarcoidosis. And then they can go to the various hospitals across the country, including Patworth, and they can come to our, our website, the ILD website, uh, and there'll be specific information there to guide them and, and help them along the way. In terms of information, I think there should be a lot more information available for, for GPs. Um, cardiac sarcoidosis is a, a, a complicated condition uh, and there are relatively few people interested in it in the UK. Um, but I think it'd be great to have a lot more information readily accessible for, for other doctors and GPs. Um, so we applied a couple of years ago for, for the Sarcoidosis UK and British Lung Foundation grant and we're very uh, lucky to be awarded a grant for a three-year project in cardiac sarcoidosis. Um, the application was quite tough. Uh, there was a series of uh, documents that we had to write and then that went off for peer review. So other experts who were anonymous uh, commented and said what was good about it and what needed improvement. And uh, in fact, the first year we applied, we were actually turned down, but we were given great advice on how to improve it. And we applied again and were lucky to be shortlisted. Um, the money was given to our research department in Patworth uh, and that is used just for um, scans and, and, and other tests on patients but also we're lucky in that it's, it's funded a part-time research nurse so we have a cardiac sarcoidosis research nurse two days a week to help us run that study and also um, interact with patients with cardiac sarcoidosis. Um, in terms of other research about cardiac sarcoidosis, we're very uh, lucky that we were recently awarded another grant. Um, this was from a, a US charity, the Foundation for Sarcoidosis Research, and it's actually another cardiac sarcoidosis project. Uh, and I'm convinced that without the grant from Sarcoidosis UK, um, we wouldn't have been successful in the new US grant. Uh, the new uh, grant from the US charity allows us to work with uh, 10 or 11 hospitals around the world uh, and we're all looking at the same thing to look at better ways of diagnosing cardiac sarcoidosis using simple tests and, and PET scans. Uh, that grant is due to start sometime in 2019 and it'll be a big multi-centre grant and uh, we're very excited to be part of that and that'll help further answer some of the key questions that we're looking at in cardiac sarcoidosis. In terms of research in cardiac sarcoidosis, um, there is a lot of interest at the moment. So I have colleagues at the, the Royal Brompton Hospital looking at pulmonary hypertension in cardiac sarcoidosis and, and lung heart sarcoidosis. I have uh, colleagues uh, and contacts in the United States looking at, at PET scans and different types of PET scans to diagnose cardiac sarcoidosis. And I think over the last few years, um, groups of us have gotten together and, and realized that actually it's probably a bigger problem than we'd thought because not only um, can it be fatal, but it can affect people who are otherwise relatively young and healthy. And so there's a lot of interest in this area and hopefully there'll be a lot of exciting research from um, all of my colleagues around the world over the next few years, specifically in cardiac sarcoidosis. Uh, in terms of cardiac sarcoidosis specialists, there are really very few who are interested in that. Um, some of them meet at, at WASOG, which is the World Sarcoidosis and Granulomatous Conference, and then some of the big other conference, the European or the American Thoracic Society conferences, ex experts meet, but um, it's uh, so much um, more uh, niche than, than other parts of sarcoidosis that there are no specific uh, uh, international meetings for that yet. What happens when patients are worried about a change in their symptoms uh, and they're worried that they need to see somebody else? Um, I think that's a really difficult question. Um, most GPs are, are very good and they'll be fantastic at managing your sarcoidosis, but there may be occasions where you need a specialist either in a, a secondary care setting or in a sarcoidosis tertiary care setting. Uh, as patients, you're 
uh, allowed to ask for second and third opinions. Uh, that can either be through your physician or through your GP. And it's important that if you're uh, worried or concerned, um, that you do ask to see somebody who has a specific interest in sarcoidosis. And there are sarcoidosis clinicians across the country. Um, and if your, your GP doesn't know where your nearest one is, then a chest physician in your hospital who may be the expert, but if they're not, they may know where their local expert is. So it's important you try and, and, and ask to see someone who has a specific interest in sarcoidosis. So can palpitations happen in sarcoidosis without the heart being affected? Well, they can. Um, palpitations uh, are actually a symptom. So often it's your heart beating very fast and it can be a problem with the heart. But palpitations may just be the fact that you notice your heart is beating a bit more uh, quickly or a bit more strongly and that can happen when patients have lung sarcoidosis that can happen with patients on treatments such as steroids and that can also generally happen in patients who are anxious and, and, and not feeling quite as well um, so yes it's uh, important that we check it out to make sure it's not the heart itself that's affected by sarcoidosis but it may just be a symptom of your general health and condition is a heart murmur an indication of cardiac sarcoid? Um, not usually. Uh, most people have heart murmurs for lots of other reasons. They may be completely normal, what we call flow murmurs, or they may be because one of the heart valves is not working quite as well as it should. And that happens as people get older or with other diseases. Uh, rarely the sarcoidosis granulomas can affect the heart valves themselves and cause damage, but um, heart valve murmurs are not necessarily due to the sarcoidosis. They may simply be due to uh, other abnormalities in the heart. Um, if a patient has a slightly abnormal ECG, do they need further tests? I think with sarcoidosis, that's very important. In patients who are otherwise well, if they have a very slightly abnormal ECG, but are otherwise well, um, their, their doctor or nurse may feel they don't need any further heart tests, and that's appropriate. But the problem with sarcoidosis is that it can affect the heart in lots of strange ways. And if somebody or if one of my patients had a very slightly abnormal ECG uh, or a heart tracing, I'd always think it would be important to do some further specialised tests to make sure they didn't have any heart sarcoidosis itself. Um, why do we still know, not know what causes uh, sarcoidosis? Um, it's just one of those things, unfortunately. Uh, we've known about sarcoidosis for more than 100 years. In fact, the very first case was presented uh, at a meeting uh, in London. Uh, a coal worker who, uh, a surgeon, uh, examined and found some odd lesions on their skin. But in all that time, the 100 or so years since we first picked up sarcoidosis, uh, a lot of research has been done. And it's still such a mysterious disease. We think or we're pretty confident that it's caused by lots of different things that trigger the immune system and these granulomas or clumps of tissue are the final product but that actual pathway the actual way when that happens um, is really not fully understood and it may be a very long time before we get some clearer answers as to the actual cause of that pathway that causes those granulomas in sarcoidosis. Uh, one of the few things I'd advise a sarcoidosis patient to do to keep them as well as possible um, I think it's general health. It, it's predominantly a lung disease, but it can affect any part of the body and it can have systemic symptoms. So people generally feel unwell. So it's just sort of uh, eating well, um, good lifestyle measures, trying to exercise, the, the standard things you see with most patients. Specifically, we know that sarcoidosis fatigue or tiredness can be a huge problem. So try and um, see a specialist who's interested in fatigue and try and get someone to work out if you're tired, why you're tired. And I think the third thing I'd say is sleep hygiene. And in lots of our lung diseases, we forget that sleep is such an important part of it. And we have uh, in Patworth and in lots of other hospitals, um, sleep experts that just deal with sleep medicine. And sarcoidosis can affect the sleep in lots of ways and cause sleep apnea or disturbed sleep patterns. And I think if you're having difficulty sleeping, it's really important that you get some uh, help with, with sleep hygiene so that you're, you sleep well, um, that you're not tired during the day and that you're as, as fit and healthy as you can be. In terms of sarcoidosis research, there's a lot going on both in the UK and around the world. Personally, something I'm very interested in, um, the idea of newer and better scans to diagnose sarcoidosis. So specifically in Cambridge, we're working with the university, looking at new forms of PET scanning in sarcoidosis to see if we can diagnose it better. Um, lots of our patients end up having biopsies, and it'd be great to have scans that were so good uh, with blood tests that were so good that actually we could diagnose sarcoidosis without doing invasive biopsies. And I think in the future, when scans and other, other forms of imaging get better, we'll hopefully be able to diagnose patients, but also monitor their disease much better rather than uh, sticking needles in them and doing biopsies.